Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca, the head of the Uncommon Community at Common Room, and today I'm super excited because our featured expert is Evan Hamilton, who's been growing the community team at Reddit over the last four and a half years, and who is currently leading community work there that is specifically focused on moderators and new program development. Um, so he's been leading community for a really long time across a lot of really cool community spaces. He also shares his wealth of knowledge on his blog, Community Manager Musings, as a community consultant, and through a super great newsletter called Community Manager Breakfast. Um, so really excited to welcome you here, Evan. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Uh, will you tell us a little bit about how you arrived in community over 10 years ago and then what you do at Reddit today to perhaps add a little more detail to that very fast brief intro I gave you, which does not do you justice? <laughs> well, I think it's approaching 15 years, which makes me feel very old. Nah. Uh, as many people did, I, I stumbled into community, but I, I think my passion for community and specifically for internet communities started at an earlier age i you know grew up when the internet was finally becoming a household thing and when i was in high school i was not the coolest kid just you know surprise uh and what i found online and and in real life with theater was that you didn't have to be the cool kid you didn't have to be the skinny funny person you could find people who had the same interests as you and really connect and, and get a ton of value there. And so I think community, you know, really saved me from becoming someone who, you know, was just lost. It, it, it helped me find my people. And, you know, I went off and became a theater major and tried to go do lighting design. And it turns out it's really hard to find a theater job. And I stumbled into tech and discovered this role that didn't really exist. I mean, if you told people, they'd say that's not a real job, which was community management. And it was perfect because it was that bringing together of people to create positive outcomes for them and frankly, you know, for the company as well. And that idea has stuck with me of just my job is to create these win-win situations. And that's super amazing to get to come and do that every day. And so for the past four and a half years, I've been here at Reddit. Uh, we are a community of communities. Uh, we have tens of thousands of volunteer moderators who make these communities happen on subjects ranging from gaming to movies to mental health to identity to everything under the sun, really. And so I spend a lot of my time thinking about how do I enable community builders to do their job at scale, a very large scale. Uh, and so it's a lot of you know, communications, uh, building programs, building relationships, and ensuring that you know, our moderators have the tools they need. Well, I'm super glad that you found your people and that now you get to find you get to help people find their people, um, which I guess is like the the win 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 type of thing. Um, so like you said, there are so many types of communities on Reddit, no matter how you slice it, leading community or building communities at Reddit is a extremely incredible feat. Um, and I think that there's a, like, so there's thousands of communities, exponentially more concurrent conversational threads happening, millions of people interacting with it in the, around the world. Um, if you were to give us a tour of your brain, do you see patterns emerge among different quote, air quote, categories of communities on Reddit that help you serve different types of Reddit communities in different ways? Yeah, I think actually we can, you know, extract that out and talk about communities in general on the internet. Uh, this is a subject I'm super interested in. I was just digging in on this with some colleagues the other day. You know, uh, there's a lot of um, conflation happening. There's a lot of people saying community. You know, we've probably all gotten a message from like, the DMV being like, thanks for being part of our community and guessing <laughs> nobody really feels like they're part of that community. <laughs> and so, you know, I think of a couple different kind of layers. There's audience. And so lots of brands have audiences. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a group of people who are listening to what you have to say. That's not a community by any means. You know, if you tell me I'm part of a community of millions of people who read a newsletter, I don't know them. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm merely an audience member. The next layer in, which I think we don't talk about a lot, and, and frankly is kind of an emerging concept for me, is sort of a proto-community called a fandom. And I've really started breaking these out as their own thing because I think they act a little bit differently. This is a group of people who are coming together with you know a common interest, who are interacting with each other, but maybe not so much 
with a common goal or getting value from each other, but more just to hype each other up. And again, nothing wrong with that. We're, we're all part of those. I'm, I'm a big, you know, Marvel fanboy. And so I spend a lot of time in Marvel spaces getting really excited about what's coming next. But that has a little bit more of just a focus on hype and excitement and let's all get hyped and excited together. And then I think the next layer down, you have the true communities. And I think we have both fandoms and communities on Reddit. Uh, But the the true communities are when people, again, they have that common interest, situation, mission. They come together, but they have a a common effort that they're pushing towards, and they get there by interacting with each other. And I think a lot of businesses miss that interacting with each other part. That is where the value comes. That is where you are providing something that you as a company couldn't do on your own, is connecting people who can share their experiences, their knowledge, who can work together to get somewhere. And so I think that's the kind of true community you see. And then within those, you know, there's all sorts of topics on Reddit. You know, it's everything from stop drinking to, you know, lacqueristas who about nail polish to politics to everything in between. And so, you know, I think you can have a community really on any topic. Um, but I think those are kind of the three layers we see these days. T-I-L, a lacquerista is someone who does na- like puts, oh, wow. It's a fun community. That, you know, I'm gonna like subreddit that immediately after this interview, that's pretty cool. I had no idea. I love that. Um, so the knowledge that you bring over the, those 15 years, let me redo my math that I stated <laughs> earlier. Um, to leading and listening and growing with the Reddit community comes from a pretty deep background across the community space overall and across industries and experiences. You started, you cut your teeth, I think, as you explained it to me, um, briefly as a community or like stepping your toe in the water, right, as a community ambassador at Flock. And then you ended up leading community at Coursera and then CMX. So across these experiences, you increased. And I love how you talk about this because I think it also... Um, illustrates the different ways that community can have a true impact, not only from people to people, and also people and positive business outcomes that end up serving the people um, that use those businesses and products. And so you've increased customer satisfaction and user retention, you've decreased support contacts, you've launched meetups and conferences, no easy feat ever, you developed volunteer and ambassador programs, and you established community advisory councils, which I think is super special. Um, can you talk a bit more about these types of outcomes? Like, how did your work in community directly impact those things? How are you able to tie business outcomes to your community efforts? And then where do you maybe see this type of work going? Or what are you looking to do next, specifically at Reddit? Yeah. So business outcome is always where I start, not because that's the only thing that matters. I think equally important is what your community's goal is, but because you know, someone's paying the bills and you have to make sure you're accomplishing those goals. And oftentimes I hear in community building, you know, people are like, oh, it's just community, it's pure. But if you're being paid to do it, then there's a financial goal behind it. And the more you can align with that, then the more freedom you have to do all the you know, beautiful, wonderful, artistic things that we all kind of want to do. And so, you know, with User Voice, uh, which was a, a B2B SaaS company um, providing customer service tools at the time, you know, the focus was really on okay, we are bootstrapped, we're this tiny company without VC funding, and we are facing off against Zendesk and other very large companies, and so how do we stand out in the crowd? And the thing we could do was make our customers and our prospects feel special. And so we did that through meetups, we did that through conferences, we created this feeling of, okay, if you're a customer service professional, you're not lesser than engineers, but you are actually just as important, just as smart, and you can learn from each other and grow and grow in your roles. And you know, we saw this in, in the satisfaction from these customers and from the word of mouth because they were willing to go out and talk about us as someone who cared about them versus someone who just provided some software. Um, you know, when I was at CMX, uh, another bootstrapped company, uh, you know, three people when I was there. And, you know, this team was really focused on how do we become the, the industry standard organization for community professionals. And so for that, it was really looking at are we providing value to these folks that nobody else is? And so um, that comes down to, you know, surveying and asking people, hey, are we actually providing this value? Looking at, who else are they using? How much time are they spending with us? And then that allows you to figure out, okay, which of these things are most valuable? We do this report every year, but are people getting much value out of it? We have this conference, 
uh, you know, it's successful, but would it be more successful if we got more speakers or if we focused on the quality of the speakers? Um, so that really leads you down the path to, you know, the specific programs and metrics you can tweak. And then at Reddit, you know, we're really looking at, uh, we're advertising fueled. And so we want people to be creating a lot of content and reading a lot of content. That also means that our spaces on Reddit need to be high quality, unique and interesting, which requires, you know, our tens of thousands of volunteer moderators who are spending all this time creating these spaces and curating them. And so the focus then becomes, okay, are these volunteers happy? Do they trust us? Are they willing to adopt new features that might increase the number of users who are uh, using our platform? And so, you know, ultimately it's often a very simple metric. And then from there, there's a number of metrics that feed into that, that you can affect with your programs. Yeah, I'd love to dig into that just a little bit more, perhaps it's like um, there's that moment, right, where you're like, well, we do have the power or or we have an opportunity or some way to differentiate ourselves where we can make our users feel special. And in this case, right, you have users, external users, but then you have the moderators, which are also, let's say, your customers or users in a very specific sense. Um, is there are there certain ways that you really focus on saying like how do we figure out what makes our moderators feel special and how do we double down on that for them yeah yeah we've done plenty of you know surveying and, and had plenty of conversations with them which really is the bedrock of any community strategy is actually talking to people and understanding what motivates them and you know for moderators on Reddit, what we found is that they're very intrinsically motivated by helping their community. And so really what they need from us is that we see them, that we know that they're putting that work in and that we're enabling them to do it. Um, so, you know, that gives us a very specific set of things we can do. You know, we can say that we appreciate them. We can host events to show that we appreciate them. We can you know, get tools built for them. We can eliminate roadblocks for them. Um, and I think that's not dissimilar from, you know, what anyone can do in any community role, which is really understanding what is the core motivation of someone. It might be that they want to get better at their craft. It might be that they want to get that next uh, promotion. You know, I think the Salesforce community is really good at thinking about, okay, this person wants to get promoted. That's good for the company because then they're, you know, someone who loves Salesforce who's higher up. And so how can we help them with their professional goals, whether it's learning, whether it's giving them opportunities to lead, whether it's you know, giving them awards for, you know, best Salesforce usage, et cetera. Um, so again, it, it's, it's that win-win of what are they motivated by and then how does that tie back to what we're trying to do? Yeah, I can imagine a world too where at those meetups or events or conferences that you talked about giving someone the platform to be that speaker, right? To have that first time where they say like, hey, here's the presentation that I gave to X amount of people. Um, also, being a motivational way if that person wants to get a promotion right or or wants to perhaps build their brand and like their knowledge and expertise in that space and um, yeah one of the moments i'm most proud of is for cmx summit you know we generally had people who had done a lot of public speaking but we created a lightning round which was just like five minute presentations mostly from people who had never presented before and we asked for submissions and we dug through and found these kind of diamonds in the rough where someone was like, oh, yeah, I did a lurker week and got like 20 percent of my lurkers to engage. And we're like, wait, wait, wait a second. You need to tell everyone about that. That's amazing. And what I remember to this day is that we had someone who spoke for the first time. They were a little shaky, but they they pulled it off. And a couple of years later, they came to me and they said, like, you unlocked the love of public speaking for me. And now I speak all the time and I'm way better at it. And so it was just, you know, creating that opportunity, which also created these five minutes of fantastic content for us. Wow, that is really cool. Also, do you remember those key takeaways from activating a week of lurker or lurkers? The week? <laughs> I could probably happens. find the talk. It was really interesting. It was basically around owning the fact that they were lurkers, saying, hi, lurkers, we welcome you, and encouraging the rest of the community to engage with them. And so just giving them that permission to like, it's okay to be a lurker and to speak up for the first time, and we'll be here and support you. Um, which frankly, you know, feels, I think, very touchy feely on the surface. But going back to, you know, community work being just as serious as any other work, there is a lot of, you know, psychological safety work that is not as as touchy feely as it seems is actually really thinking about how do you create the structure where people can come in and really feel comfortable engaging in your communities and i think it's one of the most neglected areas of community building we just kind of we create the space and then we 
start hosting events rather than thinking about, well, what's it like when someone first walks in that door and is intimidated by what's going on? Yeah, I think that's a great call out. Or or what we do too is then we say, hey, these 20 or 100 people are our most active. And so then we naturally are like, oh, that's where we should focus. Rather than also saying, okay, what is the mix here? What is the balance? And how do we say, what would be the reasons why these other people aren't ready to engage yet? Or like, how do we open that door? I think I forget who said this. If you know the quote, please help me attribute it. Um, if you're standing inside the room, open the door for other people. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, you talked a little bit about the being at bootstrap communities, right? Or just starting out or being at um, or bootstrap startups or companies, really. And so for communities who are just starting out, um, where do you recommend a small team or perhaps even just a team of one or a team of 0.5 of one person, depending on where they are at in their organization? Um, where do you recommend they focus to see the biggest initial positive impact of their work? Yeah, I mean, I really believe in the minimum viable community approach, which is very similar to minimum viable product. I think it starts again with your business goal. Um, you know, one of the models I worked on at CMX was the spaces model. Highly recommend that for just thinking through the different ways community can help your company. You'd be surprised how many companies come to me and they say, we want to build community. And I'm like, great, why? And they say, I don't because we're supposed to. And I love the enthusiasm, but if you go in without a goal, at some point you're going to say, this is costing us a lot of money. What is this doing for us? And so the spaces model says you can make customer support more efficient. You can give, get product insight. You can drive acquisition. You can create content. You can engage users and you can help users succeed. So that's spaces. Um, so figuring out where you're going to start there. Many communities do multiple things within the spaces model, but you want to choose one to start with. And then going out and talking to your target audience. And I would try and get that as narrow as possible, by the way. It's really easy to say, like, we're going to create a community for all salespeople, but salespeople at a 60 person business are very different from salespeople at a, you know, 8,000 person business. Um, so narrow it down and then just have conversations. And it, it sounds really basic and boring, but it's, 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 it's the human work. You know, what are people motivated by? What are their challenges? What are their fears? What are they excited by? And then where are their gaps that you can address? And so that's what we found, again, going back to my experience at User Voice, customer service professionals felt like frauds. They're like, I didn't go to school for this. There's all these engineers who know all this stuff, we make way more money than me. I don't know anyone else who does this, so I don't know if I'm doing it wrong. And they needed to feel like they were legitimate, and they were, but they, they didn't have that validation. And so a lot of what we did was just connect people to share their stories, share their frustrations and their concerns. And they got a lot of practical use out of it, but the main thing they got and the main thing they mentioned over and over to me was like, I feel like I'm legitimate now. I feel like my job is real. and you know, I am a, a part of this industry as much as anyone else. And so really trying to identify those kind of emotional gaps or goal gaps, if they're trying to get to the next level of their profession, what is it that's preventing them from getting there? And then figuring out how could you address that and testing it. And I think, I don't know what it is about humans, but we love to like build something big and pull the sheet off and be like, ta-da, and that's the worst way to launch anything uh, because we don't know what's going to work. And, and, you know, I've fallen into this trap many times where I spend way too much time planning something and then launch it, and it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. And so once you think you have that win-win of business goal and community need, try it out. I think events are the easiest way to try this because there's no long-term expectations there. So you say, okay, we think that, you know, our audience is... Uh, trust and safety personnel, and we think that what they need is an outlet to talk about the stressful things they deal with. Host an event, a one-time event, and say, hey, trust and safety folks, we're inviting you to this event to talk about these things. And look at how many people do you invite that RSVP, how many people show up, how many people ask you afterwards, like, hey, are you doing another one of these? That was great. Um, that's a really cheap and easy way to test this out. And you're going to be able to tell pretty quickly because if you haven't hit the nail on the head, you're going to get a lot of folks who are like, yeah, I'd really love to go to that. I'm just really busy. Or they come, but they're like on their phone the whole time or afterwards they just like leave as soon as they can. And so, you know, it, it is a very quick way to understand, you know, how robust your funnel is and, and how enthusiastic people are. 
And you can do a bunch of those and figure out what is most compelling for folks. And then from there, you can figure out, okay, what is the like actual final form factor for my community? Is it a forum? Is it a series of events? Is it big conferences? And you can start to experiment with that. But you really want to avoid getting too far kind of down the rabbit hole before you know you have something that people are excited about. Yeah, I feel like that's almost every joke I tell. I'm like, I've been working on this one, ta-da! And everyone's like, ooh. Yeah. And you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have spent so much time on the front end of that joke there. <laughs> um, something that I really admire about you, and I, I deeply appreciate your gratitude for your work and how you openly acknowledge that you, and this includes me, um, we're really privileged to work in this space. Um, and part of that, at least for me, comes from being able to represent people outside of my company who care about us enough to offer feedback, spend their time in our communities, like you know, asking questions about the product, pushing for better experiences, um, and then being able to show that, at least in my position, being able to show that feedback to internal teams. And I think that, um, like we, I, I, we here at Common Room and Uncommon, we want to show that we believe that community matters, and we also want to be able to show that community matters. And so I'm wondering if across your experience, like luckily for us here, and perhaps at Reddit as well, right, it's like we're predicated on the fact that community matters, but there are a lot of folks who have to kind of race or walk extraneously this uphill battle about like winning internal buy-in like there's a hypothesis that community matters other people have said or know that community matters so okay like let's start to invest in community um but then you have to build these bridges to actually continue winning that community investment until you're able to like have enough evidence and proof that yes indeed community matters and so I'm wondering how you've built those bridges before or how you've helped other people build, build those bridges. I mean, if there are any metrics or other tools you recommend to bring to the table when you're trying to build those bridges and tie the like, you know, map the one to one positive community outcomes is positive business outcomes. Yeah, it's it's a really challenging area. And I think this has been one of the biggest areas of growth in my career. Uh, you know, I remember many years of being my head against the wall being like, you should care. And I'm sure probably every department feels that way. You know, I've heard engineers be like, why don't they care about engineering? I'm like, really? Oh, it seems to me like they do. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side. Yeah. The two kind of big structural things I recommend. The first one is really understand the company goals and the goals of your peers and try and orient your work around that. It doesn't mean completely changing it to just, you know, utterly make it unrecognizable, but thinking about, okay, if, if I really want to build a community of practice, but the company's goals are really around recurring revenue, you know, how can I actually tie that to it? Can I target a specific type of person? Maybe I only want people who are customers and maybe I want to make it a community of practice for, you know, the type of person who we want to have renewing contracts. Um, and also just how you phrase it to those teams, right? You don't go in and say, here's what I want to do because I want to do it. You say, here's how this is going to help you achieve your goal. And it sounds like stupidly simple, <laughs> like, oh, of course you say it that way. But I, I think it really is an art to figure out how to explain your work in the context of other people's work, because you're just coming from a different perspective. And so, you know, it's empathy, just like we have empathy for our community members, we have to have it for our coworkers and understand what they're trying to accomplish. The second part, which is trickier, is helping them come to the same conclusions you did. There was a, a fascinating study where uh, there were two groups of smokers. And for the first group, uh, some actors read the side effects of smoking. And for the second group, the smokers themselves read the side effects aloud. So it was the same exact words, but one was actors saying it and one was actual smokers. And I believe the result was that the smokers who read it aloud were less likely to smoke in the future. It wasn't that the words necessarily were convincing on their own, it was that they felt like they had come to that conclusion themselves instead of someone telling them, which is challenging because Usually what we can do is we can go and we can tell someone with our mouths why something should be important. And so it's a really tricky challenge, but finding paths to help people come to the same conclusions as you is like the ultimate trick. And, you know, one of the things I built at Reddit after you know, a couple of years of trying to get people to care as much as I did about moderators was 
uh, something we call adopt an admin, where we have staff members join a moderation team for two weeks and just do the same thing moderators are doing alongside them. And without fail, people come out of that and they say the exact same things I've been saying to them for a long time. Wow, moderators work so hard, like they're so smart, they really need investment. We, we, we're not doing enough. And they get committed to making that investment. And it's just because they got to experience it themselves, apply their own values to it, kind of come to that conclusion on their own. Um, it's not a light lift, you know, and, and especially, you know, when you're starting out a new company, you might not be able to ask for that level of commitment, but looking for those opportunities to let people kind of discover things a little bit on their own instead of just tell them, listen, I know what I'm talking about and you should do what I say. Yeah, that's also so cool because there's one way I was thinking maybe you were going to go in this direction where you're like, hey, you know, what are some communities you belong to and almost making them retell moments mm -hmm. where they felt belonging or inclusion or excitement around a community from their own experience. But I like that you took it. Um, you took it a step further in terms of like not just imagine yourself in this space and what it's meant to you, but actually put yourself in this space of the people who are doing this every day at this particular role, um, which I think is like that's anyway, you went next level. Yeah. That's awesome. But, but that's a, a great example, too, and a much easier one to do, which is just <laughs> making sure people have a reference point because they often don't really know what you mean by community. They might think about you know, going back to audiences like, okay, you mean social media, you mean a newsletter, you know, what does this look like? It might sound touchy feely to them. You know, the words we use matter for a long time. We would use the word drama at Reddit and more, you know, kind of business focused teams were like, we don't care about drama. And then I started talking about trust and they were like, Oh, that's a much more official word. We care about trust. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I think that's absolutely a totally valid way of approaching it is just how can you give them a reference point that it exists within their own life? Yeah. Um, well, I like both. Maybe we could go, you know, dual pronged approach. If one doesn't work, then you employ the other. There you go. Um, so let's talk a little bit about community interaction styles. Um, I'm going to reference a blog that you wrote that I thought was pretty cool. Uh, so in this blog, you appreciate you say that you appreciate Slack, but also ask community managers to not view it as a panacea, which I thought is a very apropos word to use there, because um, I think we see it pop up so much. It's like, okay, I'm going to have a community instead of you know Twitter is just so Twitter is social media. It's not necessarily a community, but once I move it to Slack, it's now a community. And I think that there is, um, it's certainly an incredibly helpful channel to open. It has that synchronous communication and people can kind of react more in real time. It's a little bit more private than Twitter. There's all these like pros. Um, and, but anyway, I think you break it down a little bit more, right? To say like, don't just like, put a slack on it. There's like, it's more than that. And so one of our uncommon community members, Mike Ma from Research Rabbit, uh, he broke down his understanding of community platform options pretty eloquently. So I'm going to borrow some of his own words here. Um, his team evaluated platforms and channels across three dimensions. So he did sync versus async. So it's like discord versus discourse, public versus private. So it was like Slack versus Reddit um, and anonymous versus verified. So Reddit or discord versus Slack or a closed invite only community. Um, so I'd love to ask you about these like platform options and platform options for connecting with and growing a community. So how do you see not only Slack, as you shared a little bit about, but platforms like Discourse and Discord fitting into community management tool belt? And when should a community leader consider opening up new channels? Yeah, I love how you broke that down because I think the opportunities and challenges for things like Discord and Slack have to do both with the synchronicity as well as the public versus private nature. And, you know, the way I think about sync versus async is that synchronous experiences are peak experiences, right? Like, you know, for most people, our top experiences with someone are in real life, right? It's not, oh, you wrote that email and that's my best <laughs> interaction <laughs> with you. Occasionally, if someone's who's a really good writer, but most of us, it's, oh, it's that time we hung out. And, you know, the asynchronous keeps us going in between. If we only hung out once a year and didn't talk in between, it wouldn't be as powerful. But if we never hung out in person, it, it also wouldn't be as powerful. And so I think of synchronous as a really powerful tool for these powerful moments, but it can be frankly exhausting <laughs> to do constantly. And so I think async is a really good way to have a connective tissue in between those really powerful synchronous events. I think what 
often ends up happening with Slack is that there's, or, or Discord, any, any live chat platform, is that there's maybe not enough to discuss. Um, people feel left out because they're not hanging out there all day. Um, again, you got to think about your audience. If it's customer service professionals, they actually, you know, they're context switching a lot between tickets. And so they could pop into a Slack. If you're talking about executives, they don't have a lot of free time. They're just hanging out on their computer. They're not going to spend a lot of time in a Slack. So you create that that loss of interaction because people aren't able to be there synchronously. You create a little bit of a loss of context because it's this stream of consciousness versus these organized threads. So if I want to come in, I specifically want to talk about response times, I have to see through all of these little lines, which one is you know this conversation versus, oh, looking at these topics. OK, here's the topic on response time. So I just think constant synchronous communication is not ideal. Um, it works for some communities, and it works well for fandoms, again, where people are just sort of like, woo, everything's awesome. Check out this awesome thing I saw. This is so exciting. That's fine, because there's not a lot of signal people need. They just need to feel the hype. Uh, but if you're trying to create a community that's actually providing you know, value to people aside from hype, it's going to be challenging to have it be synchronous all the time. I think those are fantastic for those peak moments. I think the other factor, as, as this gentleman mentioned, is public versus private. Um, and there's sort of public, private, there's also indexed and not. And one of the biggest problems with Slack and Discord communities is they're not indexed by Google. And you may or not, may not care about this. I mean, again, that goes back to your business goals. If you're trying to get lots of new people in who might not know your community, you probably want it to show up in Google search results. If you are like very picky about who joins and you want to hand choose them and get them into the community, that's fine. You don't, you don't need nor probably want your posts in your community to show up publicly. So that's another factor that you need to bring into the equation. And then on the last point, uh, I think there is uh, a, a spectrum here. There's true anonymous, which is just anyone can post anything at any time with no identification attached to them. There's pseudonymous, which is what Reddit is, where you have a username that is attached to you. It's not you know, your verified real name, but you use the same one all the time or theoretically. And then there's our, all the way up to like fully verify this is who you are and this is what you do. And I think there's benefits for each. That one's a, a bit more of a trade-off. There's this myth that pseudonymity creates toxicity, and that's been pretty thoroughly debunked, actually. Um, I mean, anecdotally, you can look at certain real name platforms and see that there's plenty of toxicity, but there have also been studies done that show that that's not necessarily true when it comes to pseudonymity. When it comes to full anonymity, when there's just, you are just shouting into the void, you know, and nobody can see your face, you do often see more toxicity. And so pseudonyms are this nice middle ground where people don't necessarily have to attach their real name to something, but they feel care for their account. They feel like they are putting an identity forward. And so they are less likely to be toxic. And pseudonymity can be really beneficial for you know, marginalized groups, for people in countries with you know, oppressive regimes, even just, you know, we've seen this with teenagers, they use, pseudonymity and different accounts as ways to explore facets of their personality as they're still developing, they're still figuring out who they are. Um, you know, we've seen this with, you know, women dealing with postpartum depression, and that's a really hard thing to come out with your full real name and talk about, but they find these support groups. So there's a lot of benefit there. But obviously, if you are, you know, having a professional community focused on uh, chief revenue officers, you don't want to have a bunch of random people in there who aren't chief revenue officers because that's going to create a lot of mess. So it really, again, comes back to what your business goals are. I don't think there's any one approach that is wrong, but you really have to examine the trade-offs. And I think it's too common for people to say, well, everyone knows how to use Slack or everyone knows how to use Facebook groups. It's really easy to set up. That's the best place to start my community. And then you might get yourself in a trap where either people aren't engaging or you don't have access to the data you need various challenges. So it's really worth taking that time to figure out what platform and, and what type of community is going to aid you best. I, to be to totally transparent here, have not done enough thinking around the difference between anonymity and pseudonymity. And so thank you so much for thoroughly breaking that down, because I think for a while, or in my head, I would say, uh, you know, Reddit 
allows for anonymity, but I, I've just been schooled. Um, so I, I <laughs> to be fair, I think about it a lot. <laughs> um, so I would, I want to talk a little bit more about like how Reddit fits in there. I, I would say that Reddit is, you know, there's a, 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 a very large publicness about it, although it's not fully anonymous as you just described, right? It's pseudonymous. Am I saying that right? Pseudonymous? You are. It took me like two years to say it right. So. <laughs> um, and it's, but it like, despite the fact that it could be pseudonymous or it is pseudonymous, um, there is a delightful amount, I would say, at least in my experience, of cohesion and generally good vibes. Um, there are certainly corners of every place, but in general, um, I think many many people's experience are like that too, or else Reddit would not have the the love and returning users that it does and the activity. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about how you and the community teams at Reddit think about maintaining that and, and how do you track which members need help? Um, and, and how do you get that, that to them in terms of like, it, there's like layers of complexity, I think around pseudonymity, global scale, um, and like cohesion and, and cultural differences, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Endless topics we could dig into there. I, I think a couple cr crucial things here. The first one is that, you know, we have individual topic based communities. And, you know, I've already talked about the, the wide variety that exists. And I think this differs from a lot of social media, because when you are walking through the town square that is certain social networks, you could be hearing somebody talk about the latest Marvel movie, and then all of a sudden somebody is talking about politics, and it can be very disorienting. And while Reddit does have a public feed, a lot of our focus is around the communities that you join and the interests that you have. And so your experience on Reddit can be entirely cute animals, it can be super gaming focused, it can be an eclectic mix of politics and comic books and fashion, whatever you want it to be. And we empower people to create these unique spaces that have their own norms and vibes and rules. And we have a two-tiered moderation system. So we have our site-wide rules. We have a trust and safety team that makes sure that we are protecting our users. But then each of these communities create their own spaces and have their own additional rules. And these can be silly. You know, if you go into r slash cat standing up, every post has to be a cat standing up and the title has to be cat, period. But they can also be you know, much more subtle. If you check out Change My View, this is a, a very you know, nuanced, structured debate where someone comes in with a view, asks others to change it, and they approach it in a certain way and have certain rules for how you engage with it. And that really allows people to find spaces that are compelling to them and for us to not dictate every single aspect of the experience and let people kind of create that for themselves. So I, I think you know those are important kind of foundational aspects. And then you know to your other questions about how we maintain that, you know it's very much a snowflake model. You know we, we are in the center. Then we have these moderators. Then we have lead moderators, and then other moderators on the teams, and then the users. And you know the control is federated out gradually throughout those groups. And so we really have to think about you know how are we leading from the top. So we spend a lot of time with our moderators because these are the most you know kind of visible, you know powerful members of our communities who are going to set the tone and uh, the culture on Reddit. And so a lot of it is thinking about you know what is the education we need to do, what is the vibe we want to set, and then what are the indicators that something might be headed in the wrong direction. Because frankly, you know at the scale where we can't we can't catch, you know, oh, this individual user is struggling with, you know, finding their favorite community, we have to think about what are the indicators that are going to tell us if we're getting there. And so we might look at indicators like, okay, how fast is a moderation team getting through their queue of reports? And if they're not, what are the causes of that? Not let's intervene with that individual community because that isn't going to scale, but can we understand what the underlying issues are? And so it sounds very abstract, but really it just comes down to digging deeper and deeper and deeper until you can figure out, okay, this one thing all the way at this end caused this thing way over here that happens to millions of users. And so if we can work on fixing this, we'll help all of them. Yeah, and let's let's talk a little bit more about moderation because that's such a, um, a powerful, I don't want to say a tool. I mean, they're, they're humans, uh, so that's not like the right word to use but that that is a it's a mechanism right which is i think extremely tied to 
at least from an outsider's point of view, to Reddit's success, right? Being able to enable and empower moderators. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could offer any advice around what you've learned around moderation. And so there's, you know, there's setting cl clear guidelines, being able to enforce the rules, being transparent about a why. Um, but I imagine that a place as deep and rich as Reddit, you have other ideas or probably like breakthrough lessons in terms of maintaining a high bar of community and through moderation, um, especially on a platform like Reddit? I think one of the biggest lessons, and, and to some extent at this size, the lessons sound simple, but are complex in how you execute on them. One of the biggest ones is just expectations. You know, someone's expectation affects everything about what you do, because two different people with two different sets of expectations can have the same experience and come out the other side feeling differently. And I think this is, one of the things that companies in general and, and communities specifically do very badly. <laughs> we don't spend the time to say, here is what to expect when you show up here. And even just the other day, we had an event and it overall went really well, but we had a segment where people were like, "Where? why aren't you asking hard questions? And we're like, oh, the hard question segment was before, this one's something else entirely, but they didn't know, we hadn't set that expectation. And so I, I think the biggest thing you can do is make sure when people are joining the community, they know what to expect that they're committing to. I want to be part of a community like that and I will behave in that way. And then that the services you're providing, you set expectations for what those are gonna look like. Because most of the challenges we run into and I see other communities run into is just where there's a vision in one group's head and that doesn't match up with what reality is. And, and companies can spend the time to set that. And I think a, a subset of that, which is really powerful and under, underutilized in community is priming. Um, you know, there's really interesting research on how you can set people up to enter with a certain mindset. And my, my favorite example is this experiment where they took two groups of students, uh, they were taking a test, uh, they were given the opportunity to cheat basically like, accidentally slipped the answers to a test. But one group before they started the test had to sign something saying, I will abide by the school's honor code. And the group that signed that was less likely to cheat. And it's, I mean, it's just signing something, right? Like the, the honor code existed before that. It's not like saying you'll abide by it is enforceable in any way, but it put people in the mindset of, ooh, okay, I should really think about what I'm doing here. And I think we can do that a lot more in communities. And you know, we've done some of that at Reddit. I've seen Twitter do some really interesting stuff. Even you know, companies that are known for toxic communities like you know, Riot and League of Legends, they've done really interesting stuff on just like loading screens, telling people, hey, you know, teammates prefer when you treat them in a certain way and they see to toxicity decrease. And so I think that's one of the most underutilized tools is just setting people's expectations and asking them to act a certain way. And it sounds, again, really simple in practice, but to do it right is, is requires some subtlety and can have really immense benefits. Yeah, and I think maybe it's also, you know, it's something about scale. It's, it's, e it's easier when you have 10 people and you're like, okay, we sort of, we know we're quite small. We sort of set expectations inherently by way of interacting but that totally changes when you have one uh, 10 and then 20 and then 50 and then 100 and thousand and uh, you might still have this idea that everyone's operating under the same expectations but it was never actually communicated and there really is no way to know until you actually just very clearly laid out but i think it is it's easy to almost overlook how that changes over time. This idea of like, oh, aren't we all un like operating under the same expectations? And you're like, man, that was like last year. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so I'd love to talk a little bit about how you, whether or not you're hiring community teams or community colleagues or community adjacent teams, when you're looking to hire or support others in hiring, um, community teammates or people that will be focused on community, what are some of the key attributes or, or characteristics you, you think are important when looking to hire a teammate? Yeah, I mean, the, the most important one is empathy. Uh, I just, you can't build community without it and you have to have a high level of it because sometimes it can be unforgiving work. Uh, I also look for some maturity in that empathy because it can be really easy to get overly focused on an individual situation 
And the most successful, in my opinion, use of empathy is to say, okay, how can I change the system to help the most people? Like, you know, what structural changes can I make that will avoid this situation rather than trying to just solve for this one situation? I think after that, it depends on the role. And I, I think I used to think, hey, a community professional is a community professional. You know, they got empathy and that's all that matters. But I've really come around to, you know, there are very few people that possess all the skills needed in community. And usually there's two different camps that you can hire for. One is kind of the community relations, you know, person who's out there in the field who can talk people off a ledge, who can make people feel fantastic about what they're doing, get them psyched up. That is a really unique skill and lots of people just don't have it. And, and you know, if you can find someone who can do that, they're worth their weight in gold. They often are a person who dislikes spreadsheets and Asana and, you know, Gantt charts and thinking about, you know, the long-term logistics. And so there's another type of professional that I've started hiring kind of in balance, which is these program managers who are really thinking about, okay, how do we progress what we're doing? We have the person out there talking to people, but what tools, what programs, what structures can we give them to help them go farther? And if you can find someone who has both, like, great, they're going to be your boss someday. Like, those, those folks are amazing. But I've, I've come around to actually, it's fine and actually good to have different teams focused on these different areas because it's also very hard to hold in your head the long term and the short term. And so it's useful to have the person who is down in there worrying about what's happening today and then someone else who's looking at the, the long term picture. Yeah, I love that. And I love, um, I love the distinction between or the growth, right, of thinking community professional and a community professional. And I think probably even maybe five, 10 years ago, it, that may have felt more true. And then as the the space progresses, right, there are more tools or ways of looking at it and more ways that one might need to then manage up and manage down in terms of getting internal stakeholder buy-in and speaking a different language in order to do that. Um, and so I can imagine that maybe today there's two-ish buckets and then maybe 10 years from now, there's 10-ish buckets. For sure. Um, I'm curious if there's a recent big challenge that you're most stor storked, most <laughs> stoked to have solved with your community and what stands out about it to you? Well, we recently launched our, our first ever moderator training and certification program. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited and, and, and proud about that program because it's, again, solving this large long-term issue with this very you know specific approach we know that moderation teams struggle because they don't have always as many moderators as they should um, and one of the problems there is that it takes a lot of time for them to train new moderators and these are volunteers we, we don't, we don't want to make it a heavy lift for them and so this training and certification program you know, we've seen results that show, hey, these folks are actually staying on moderation teams longer because they're actually learning the things that they need to learn. Um, and so it's it's solving, you know, this distant problem in the end of these spaces being well moderated, but by addressing one specific pain point on this end and um, have a lot more coming on that front. But it's been really exciting to see the response to it because people are also really excited to learn. And it turns out you know, if you give them the tools, they'll use them. I mean, congratulations. Training insert is no small feat. It's like in it's one of those things where you're like, I get it and I see where the steps need to go and we we kind of know what we want to build, but to actually build all the things that go into a training insert program is just a long it's a process and a project and a thing and it doesn't happen overnight. And there's a lot of voices involved. Um congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before we get to our last question, which is always asking about uncommon support, I cannot let listeners leave home without knowing two more things about you. One is, can you tell us about International Beer Day? And then two is, will there be a Monsters Are Not Myths reunion tour? International Beer Day is something uh, uh, my best friend cooked up uh, uh, many years ago just a, a celebration of beer. And it was a great opportunity to, um, you know, put some 
uh, community building skills to practice. And so we uh, we managed to get it on people's radars and at one point, you know, had thousands, I believe, of bars around the world celebrating it. Um, so just goes to show if you can get people excited about something, uh, magic stuff will happen. We did that all without any money, lots of fun. Um, and yeah, probably not a reunion uh, for my band, Monsters Are Not Myths. Um, I occasionally play music uh, as Kicking Tuesdays. You can I think it's kickingtuesday.bandcamp.com if you want to check it out. Um, but yeah, music is mostly a side profession right now because it turns out um, being a dad and uh, working at Reddit take a lot of time. Kicking, kicking Tuesdays? Is that what it is? Kicking Tuesday. Cool, Kicking Tuesday. Also, I'm very impressed with your ability to say the word myths I like tried it many times and I was like, it's just going to sound like miss. It's okay. This was a, a branding mistake <laughs> and <laughs> only after saying it for like 20 years, am I able to really pronunciate it, but we would constantly have people say it's what? And so, yeah, <laughs> think about your branding before you commit to it. Yeah. That's incredible. I also have a lisp. And so it's like an extra work for the tongue. It's like, it's okay. Miss. <laughs> um, so Lastly, super excited about Uncommon Support. It's super important to us to embody what we believe. And so, and that's that a community is strongest when it uplifts one another. And so we love asking experts who come on to talk to us about what they know in community and share it with others in the community space. Um, a nonprofit and a cause that you love and that you would like to highlight, and then we donate in your honor. So I'd love to know um, which cause you decided to highlight today. And maybe you'll tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, really appreciate that you do this. Um, I've chosen Sierra Club. I've been, you know, a lifelong environmentalist, and it's only feeling more urgent now. Um, and Sierra Club is one of the most enduring and influential grassroots environmental organizations in the United States. Um, so they really, you know, take the power of community and get their millions of members to defend everyone's right to a healthy world. Um, so very much appreciate you helping the cause. Yeah, I mean, thank you. And personally, as a someone who lives in Seattle, loves hiking, loves going like backcountry trail repair. Um, I'm doubly, triply excited to offer our income and support in your honor to the Sierra Club. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks so much, Evan. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been great.